know that that was something that we had done because I remember telling people to do that. Um, I don't recall any statistics that suggested that our use of that was um, as robust as I would have liked, nor that I would have concluded that that's what caused this decrease. So I'm not suggesting that yeah. it caused this decrease. Um, but that's the only thing I can think of that the Department of Law had changed at the time. So I'm left to assume something like that must have been a change at the Department of Corrections. But again, I think they're probably better to ask than me about that. Thank you. I just I keep hearing this theory that we passed SB 91 because our prison population was going up and it was actually in a decline a year and a half before we passed SB 91. So the theory of we're going to have to build more prisons unless we pass SB 91 is, is not true, I guess, my point. Representative Ledoux. I guess I was just wondering whether or not the prison population might have declined because you lost prosecutors and there were less people who were prosecuted. Wouldn't that have perhaps had some effect? Through the chair, um, Representative Ledoux, that's very possible as well. Um, 2015, and this is why I pause when I try and think about the things that were changing. You are correct that in 2015, our budget reduction started in 2014, and I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head that we were reduced in 14, but there were reductions there. There were further reductions in 15. Um, I just don't remember how steep they were, and I, I could not tell you sitting here today how much that may or may not have an impact on that reduction. Thank you. Representative Kopp. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I think... Um some of that is we saw a peak uh, contraction of the largest police agencies in the state that year as far as um, fewer officers, fewer troopers. So APD was down one of their lowest points. And then, of course, troopers were down too. Also, I can't remember the exact date, but Palmer Correctional Center closed. And, um, and I know that uh, certainly all the high-risk offenders were moved over to, to Goose Creek and around the state. But I, I think there were some that were either eligible for parole or had were very close to flat timing out um, that um, would also account for the drop off at that time. Thank you. Um, question I wanted to ask because you had uh, I'm doing my best to ask a question I heard at a community council meeting uh, that you were attending. Are there any statutory changes from the criminal justice reform process, starting with Senate Bill 54, continuing with Senate Bill 91, continuing on to Senate Bill 55, that have caused prosecution problems, basically making legal changes that made it so that you couldn't prosecute cases. I think I remember the question that you're referring to, Representative Clayman, and um, my answer at that community council meeting was no, I don't think that there were changes that caused us to uh, decline cases that we were previously accepting. Um, the law didn't uh, make that change. I, I think that uh, for cases that we were declining that we had previously accepted was about resources, um, not about changes in the law. One final. Representative Millett. Thank you. It's just because I have you up here, and um, if you go back to Senate Bill 91, I it was just brought to my attention that in Senate Bill 91, um, you know, you have a man, if you shoot a uniformed officer, <clears throat> you, you have one sentence. But we carved out, so if you just shoot an officer and put him in a wheelchair, we reduce the sentence for that crime. So murder stayed the same, but if you shoot an armed officer and just wound them, we reduce the sentencing as we did with everything else. Is that correct? Through the Chair, Representative Millett, what SB 91 did was that with the exception of sex offenses and murder offenses, it took the presumptive sentencing ranges and adjusted them in all categories downward. So that would include any type of assault. The, the difference, however, when it comes to a law enforcement officer is that the presumptive range is the range you have to stay in if there is not an aggravating factor available. And for a uniformed officer that is shot, there is an aggravating factor that is available, and that would mean it would be up to the court's discretion how to sentence that person. Um, the presumptive ranges are still um, reduced, but that aggravator would allow a court to go above the presumptive range um, 
before any criminal justice reform occurred and after criminal justice reform occurred, and the maximum penalties did not change. So I, I don't know if I've answered the question or not, but Just that's the framework up. that I think. So we, so we did. So, so we did. It went from um, seven to five and nine, 11 to nine. So um, from Department of Law's position, carving out that uniformed officer to put it back where it was to seven to 11 years, um, was that a reasonable for uniformed officers thing to do to put it back, so just have a carve out for that um, crime. I mean, we've carved out, we carve out uniformed officers other places, why wouldn't we carve out that um, since? Um, through the chair, Representative Millett, um, the, the numbers you just gave me of those presumptive ranges are not presumptive um, ranges, those are I want to make sure that I, I say this accurately. There are presumptive ranges that are standard, and then there are aggravators. But in addition to aggravators, there's something else called special circumstances in sentencing. And special circumstances can adjust the presumptive range up slightly, but that's different than the aggravating factor. Um, I don't. I don't have the statute book in front of me at the moment, but the special circumstances, I don't recall dealt with uniform officers. I recall special circumstances uh, being things like um, being in possession of a firearm, I think, is one of them. And so... Dangerous instrument. A dangerous instrument, right. That's what I'm referring to. And so the way those two things interact is that you cannot have a special circumstance that enhances a sentence when the the description, the element of that special circumstances, the use or possession of that dangerous instrument is also an element in the underlying crime. So they can't stack together to come to create something that's more. Um, and the same concept exists with aggravators. So I'm not sure that the special circumstance applies to the scenario that you're describing to me, but I would I would need to sit down with the statutes and walk through that again um, just I'll, to make I'll sure send I'm you, right. I'll send you a question on that, just that specific um, car, just I'd like to see it carved out to have it go back to. So, so, so a question with regard to the uniformed officers, which includes firefighters, EMTs, paramedics, anybody that's essentially a first responder. In your experience in the Department of Law, has there ever been a time in which an assault, not a murder, but a, an assault is directed at a uniformed first responder of any sort in which the department declined to pursue the aggravating factor that would give the judge the fullest range of sentencing discretion? Uh, to the chair, I, I will tell you that <laughs> my position as the director of the criminal division means that I supervise um, all the prosecutors in the state. I'm only asking but, what, you what you're aware of. I'm not asking I, you to categorically, I'm just trying to No, no I, I appreciate that, and that's, that's what I want to say, is that I have not, I don't review every single case, but I am unaware of a circumstance in which uh, there was a um, first responder that we wouldn't file an aggravator like that and attempt to pursue it. Um, but, but I'm not telling you that it's never happened because I don't review every single case in the department. Representative Ledoux. Two questions, actually. So. These aggravating factors. Mm -hmm. Am I correct that one would have to knowingly endanger an officer in order for the aggravating factor to go into effect as opposed to recklessly endanger? an officer, and isn't it harder to prove knowingly than recklessly? I mean, obviously it is. Through the chair, Representative Ledoux, um, let me take those in reverse order. The, the reckless versus knowing what you're talking about is the mental state, otherwise known as the mens rea. You are correct that knowingly is a higher standard. Uh, I don't know that that necessarily means that it's harder to prove, but it's certainly a higher standard uh, that has to be proved. Um, the, whether it's, up, whether I mean, it's easier or, or less difficult to prove really depends on the facts of the case. Um, the, the first question you were asking me was, and I'm sorry, now I've lost it. So I want to repeat the question Representative will do. I mean, don't you have to knowingly yeah. for the aggravator? 
<laughs> through the chair, Representative Ledoux, uh, I don't know off the top of my head if it's required to show knowingly or not. Um, that's an interesting legal question that I would want to um, look at the statutes and look at the case law to tell you whether I thought it had to be knowingly or not. I, I certainly understand the premise that you're describing for me. Thank you. So, and the statute answers the question for me. Thank you, Ms. Schroeder. Um, the statute found at Alaska Statute 1255-155, subsection C13, says the defendant knowingly directed it. So it's right in the statute where it's required to be knowingly. So then let's get back to the, the higher bar versus higher, easier, or harder to prove. Mm -hmm. Isn't the fact that something is a higher bar pretty darn suggestive that it's more difficult to prove? I mean, that's kind of what a higher bar is, I think. Through the Chair, Representative Ledoux, uh, I understand that what you're describing is to show something that's knowingly um, seems like it would be more difficult, and it may well be. Again, I. I look at the facts in any given case and tell you whether or not I could show it as knowingly or recklessly is going to depend on the facts I have. Well, let me ask you a question. Follow up, Representative Ledoux. If you had a chance to prosecute somebody and all you had to prove is reckless rather than knowing, mm -hmm. and you had to choose which one you were going to go for, was it going to be reckless or whether it was going to be knowing? And the, the results would be the same, mm -hmm. but one or the other you have to prove. Which would you go for? <laughs> Through the Chair, Representative <laughs> Ledoux, I would tell you it would depend on the, the crime and whether reckless or knowing was more Rep appropriate. Representative Ledoux, it's an interesting rabbit hole that you've been going down, but I don't think this is, I think your point is well taken and we don't need to can, pursue can this I, angle. Go ahead with a different follow-up. Different, different question, actually. So, Last year, I remember reading and hearing about an extremely tragic uh, case. Somebody was sitting in their apartment, I think a 22, 23-year-old gal, it may have been in Mountain View, I'm not sure where it was, and somebody was having, I guess, kind of a, a wild party uh, in the apartment underneath her and was playing around with guns and somehow or other a gunshot entered her apartment and hit her while she was sitting there minding her own business and she ended up paralyzed. Uh, is, the dif is there any difference in sentence or crime which those people may or may not have been charged with uh, now that Senate Bill 91 uh, went into effect than it would have been prior to Senate Bill 91? Through the Chair, Representative Ledoux, the answer is yes. And what's the difference? Um, the, the difference is that the presumptive ranges were lowered. Um, so th Actually, there were, I think the question was elements of the crime to prove the crime, not the punishment. If Actually, they were it was convicted. both. Okay. Go ahead. So through the Chair, Representative Ledoux, the, the elements to that crime have not changed at all. Um, that there was nothing in SB 91 that touched on the elements of assault. Um, but in terms of sentencing, um, the presumptive range would be lowered to tell you whether or not that impacts the ultimate sentence that's imposed would require a detailed factual analysis to determine if there were any other aggravators or mitigators that were available. Um, that could uh, affect that presumptive range. And, and so without those details, I couldn't tell you that. But the presumptive ranges themselves were all lowered, and that would impact the case you And described. can you tell me what the presumptive follow-up? Follow up, thank you. Can you tell me what the presumptive ranges were prior to SB 91 and what the presumptive range is uh, now that we have SB 91 with respect to uh, that particular crime? I would just note, unless you actually can tell us what the actual charges were and what the person was convicted of, I think, I think we should not try to go down this path today. Uh, so to the chair and through the chair to Representative Ledoux, I, I would have to do an analysis of the, the crime that I thought it would be. I was just getting ready to turn to the assault statutes to try and sort that out. But I don't know off the top of my head 
um, shoot, shooting, hitting someone, so. causing serious physical injury, I'm guessing that's going to be in either an assault one or an assault two, and I would need to look at the statutes to tell you which one it would be. Um, in either situation, the presumptive ranges were adjusted downward. The other factors that would um, have to play into that is the presumptive range is also dependent upon the person's previous criminal history, whether or not they had prior felonies. And without knowing that information, I can't tell you the exact presumptive range that would apply to that scenario. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any other questions. Um, thank you very much. That brings us to the first of our amendments. I would note we're going to break at noon, but we are... We have amendments in front of us that have been distributed, and the plan will be to go through these in the number, in the order in which they are numbered, and the person that submitted them can either move the amendment if, or not. If you elect not to move the amendment, then, then we're going to move on and not come back to that amendment. So your decision about offering it or not is a final one. But Representative Millett, the number one is yours, and do you want to move, make a amendment? Mr. Move? Chair, I move amendment number one. Object. Okay. Um, I, I'm just getting a note to the folks listening can also find these amendments online if you want to review them. Okay, Representative Millett, go forward with regard to amendment number one. And, um, and I would, in the world of timing, I'll give you three minutes. Um, I, I'm going to ask um, my Chief Staff, Grace Abbott, to come up and, and walk us through this amendment. Um, basically, this is what we had talked about in committee, the sober law. Um, it, it directs um, duties of the Commissioner of Corrections to hold someone um, that, me, hold someone that has committed a crime, let's be clear, that has committed a crime um, in corrections until they reach the legal um, limit of not being uh, intoxicated. Uh, we heard Nancy Mead talk about this a little bit with the bail schedule, but I want to walk through the reasoning for, have Rep, uh, Grace walk through the reasoning and why, we're, uh, why I'm offering this amendment. Go ahead, Ms. Abbott. Thank you. For the record, Grace Abbott, staff to Representative Sharice Millett. Um, the reasoning behind this amendment, um, which I'll just refer to as the sober law, is that um, right now, as I think Ms. Mead from the court system aptly explained, a, the Department of Corrections is able to release someone who could potentially be over the legal limit, which at this point is set at about 0.08. Um, what this amendment would do is require the Department of Corrections, who would be releasing that person, to perform a um, blood alcohol test prior to um, their release. Uh, this would apply to misdemeanants, which we heard um, were al are also affected by the bail schedule, as well as people who have committed felonies. And, and I have some articles that I'll pass out to members um, that talk about what the risks are to the public and risks are to prisoners that we release that have um, a high alcohol content. I'll refer to the one in Fairbanks that happened where we released the gal from prison. She was intoxicated, went walking down the road, and got hit by a car. Uh, we have a gentleman in Eagle River that uh, got arrested for DUI, was released on his own recognizance, was still... Uh, intoxicated, uh, went and committed a second DUI the same um, in the same 12-hour period. Um, Mr. Chairman, I understand that you you are uh, one time one shot only on these amendments. But after hearing from um, Nancy Mead from the court system, she uh, might, may have a better solution for putting it in the bail schedule. So I will um, be holding this amendment and may come back in a different form with a different um, with a different amendment towards the bail schedule, which I think. Um, as, as we as we talk this out, and this is why the committee process is so great, and I like to take the time to do it, um, is that there might be a better way to do it uh, for just misdemeanors. Wouldn't wouldn't capture the felon felons, but as we've heard, the felony folks usually spend more time in prison, so they're more 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 likely to be sober when they're released. Not necessarily all of them, but most of them would be re released and are sober. Just for clarification, this was in existence. Uh, Anchorage Police Department used it, and other police departments used this um, until about a year and a half ago. It's a tool in the toolbox that I believe the troopers, and for me, the Anchorage Police Department would like to have back in their possession, but because it's not on the bail schedule and it's not a statute, they were informed they could not not utilize this, um, utilize this uh, tool any longer. So the request came from APD 
um, and law enforcement that they would like to see this tool replaced. Uh, so rep amendment number one is withdrawn. Correct. And I would note with regard to amendment number one, uh, I just received from Senator Coghill's office, which we'll copy and distribute, but we don't need to discuss now because the amendments are withdrawn. An opinion from alleged legal counsel or alleged counsel regarding amendment number one. Uh, I'll just note my own personal question that it looks like an amendment number one if, if say, my child was arrested for DWI and was in prison under this, was being held under this provision, they couldn't release that person to me as a sober adult to take them home. But that's another issue that Ms. Mead, I think, mentioned about she, she, sober third parties. Thank you. Yeah, she, she did bring that up and with Perfect. some other issues that we'll, we'll work on. Okay. I, I just bring those up. Amendment number two. Oh. We've actually finished discussion. It's been withdrawn. She did withdraw it. You said it. I no, she, she confirmed. Oh, I, thought she I said, is it withdrawn? And she said, yes. Okay. Representative Ledoux? Yeah, I, I would ask you to reconsider your thoughts about uh, if somebody doesn't bring them up now, they can't bring them up later. Um, I submitted all of my amendments because I thought it might be nice for uh, everybody to have the opportunity to look at those amendments. I'm not sure which of my amendments I'm going to uh, introduce now. I had figured that I would have the option, if I didn't introduce them now, to introduce them uh, later. I, I've never been in the position where uh, I couldn't introduce something later while it's still in the process for amendments to be introduced just because I, I don't want to uh, actually formally introduce it now. All right, well, uh, in light of your observation, I think that's, your point is well taken. If an amendment comes up and you choose not to introduce it, then it'll get, it'll get moved back and it, we won't be able to take it up until all the other amendments have been yes, considered. But we're not gonna, if you pass on your first opportunity, <laughs> you don't get to bring it up when you want to, you got to go back to the back of the stack. No problem. And I understand with regard, at least with Representative Millett's amendment number one, she won't come back with this exact amendment number one. It's actually been offered and withdrawn, and I think if it's been offered and withdrawn, then we shouldn't come back to it. I think that's a final decision of the of the committee. It's different if you choose not to introduce it at a different at a particular Correct. time. Correct. And, and Representative Clayman, I, I'm going to introduce it in, in meet the 5 o'clock deadline in a different form, not in the statute for DOC, maybe in the bail schedule. Mm -hmm. So it will be a different amendment, not the same I amendment. Look forward to the next version. <laughs> amendment number two, Representative Millett. Mr. Chair, I move amendment number two. Object. Um, um, amendment number two deals with the risk assessment. Uh, we heard um, uh, a lot of conversation within the Criminal Justice Commission that there would be input from um, all departments, but DOC was ultimately responsible for the um, database risk assessment tool. Uh, one of the problems that I have with just a database-based um, um, database risk assessment that there's nuances in, in Alaska and within our criminal code and within our uh, experience with criminal justice that leads us to maybe broaden our scope to have other folks look at it and I know that it's in consultation but this just puts um, it puts the um, commissioner uh, to get approval from Department of Law, Department of Public Safety, the court system before implementing the risk assessment tool. This assures that public safety has the opportunity to look at the risk assessment if there's things that they are uncomfortable with or don't um, take into account or don't um, uh, appear to be something that they feel will utilize or um, optimize the risk assessment, I want them to at least have some approval and some um, uh, input in that, same with the court system. So it's it's an approval basis. I know that Representative Eastman asked me about veto power. At this point in time, uh, I think the broader scope and the broader look that we have at our risk assessment tool, the more successful it will be. I want the risk assessment tool. It's one of the reasons I had a hard time um, not voting for the bill because I think the risk assessment tool is one of the things that's going to make this make the state and make our criminal justice system so much better. Um, it's, and, but I, I do want to have more input because I feel um, that we might be missing something, uh, a voice or, or experience 
um, from public safety and from the court system and the Department of Law that might make the risk assessment uh, more valuable and more successful. So um, I don't know, Grace, if you want to add anything else to what, we, what we've talked about. Ms. Abbott, anything to add? Uh, once again, for the record, Grace Abbott, staff to Representative Millett. Um, what this does is it, it creates some parity between the uh, creation of the tool and the adoption of regulations for the implementation of the tool. So as those are um, entities involved in the regulation process, it follows that including them in the creation process um, would make some sense. Um, it also... Uh, follows fairly closely the recommendation from the original um, Justice Reinvestment Report created by the Criminal Justice Commission, and I'm happy to to cite that. It's in uh, recommendation number two from, from that report back in uh, December of 2015. Discussion. Question. Representative Kopp. Actually, you're right. Questions first. Yeah, question. Questions first and then discussion after questions. Uh, adding the uh, um, the court system, and I guess the question would be for, uh, for you, uh, Grace, or Representative uh, Millett. Adding the court system, could we have a, a separation of powers problem um, seeking court system um, approval for a tool the executive branch is trying to um, implement for risk assessment? Once again, for the record, Grace Abbott, staff to Representative Millett, uh, through the chair, Representative Kopp. At this point, we haven't been alerted to when um, our, our council hasn't flagged it for us. Um, I would defer to the attorneys in the room as to whether or not that that could potentially occur. But at this point, it hasn't been flagged for us by, by our own council. Or drafters, rather. Okay. Other questions? Um, yeah. Just Representative Kopp, yeah. follow the, um, the Department of Law and the Department of Public Safety and the court system, are they represented, represented on the Criminal Justice Commission now? I guess that's a question. Through the chair, Representative Kopp, once again, Grace Abbott. Um, I believe they are, both in um, assistants and staff and, and their representatives. But it, it falls I can the confirm that, yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Um, but it... it uh, falls under the Department of Corrections to create and develop the tool at this point. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing no other questions, any discussion as to amendment number two? Representative Eastman. Um, yes, I'd like to hear from the court system about this amendment. Um, I don't, I'm not sure anybody from the court system is present. I'd like to request that we get somebody here. I know they can't be too far. Uh, you may be wrong about that. <laughs> and, um, I can't hear in, in the meantime, could we, I see the Department of Law is here, maybe we could have Department of Law come up and comment on, on 